Welcome to the University of North Georgia online version of Math 3350 Probability and Statistics. This is our second lesson and we'll be talking about basic counting patterns. So we have the single probability formula. We count up the total number of outcomes that are in event set A and we divide by the total number of possible outcomes in the entire probability space. So it's all about counting. So we need to learn different types of counting techniques that will speed up our work. So we have permutations. If we arrange eight books on a shelf, how many possible outcomes are in the probability space? Notice that this is draws without replacement, right? As soon as I've taken one of the eight books, I only have seven books left to place in the next slot. And also notice that, or that order matters, okay? Um, and then we have combinations where the draws are without replacement and order doesn't matter. For example, when we choose a five card poker hand at random. And finally, we have a Cartesian product. And this is just two different probability spaces kind of jammed together. For example, suppose that I rolled two dice, right? And sum their values. Well, the two different dice rolls are actually independent of each other. What happens on the first dice roll, or if I have two dice, let's say red and green die, what happens with the green dice roll has nothing to do with what happens with the red dice roll. So basically, they're a Cartesian product, and we're just going to multiply uh, to find out how many, how many outcomes there are that are possible. So before we get into the permutations and combinations, let's just take a look at, at an example. So this is all the possible three letter permutations that we can get um, from the five letters B, E, A, D, S, right? So let me, let me start at the beginning and we'll show them arriving. And I've got some color coding going on. These are the permutations that are actually built with the same letters. So in blue, notice that we have A, B, E, but those are the same letters here is in B, A, E, E, A, B, E, B, A, B, and A, E, B. So there are six permutations of these three letters. So when we're doing combinations, all, all six of these in blue would count as the same draw, right? same event right but here where order matters um, they're different now this is an example where we are just doing combinations so instead of having 60 permutations like before here we only have 10 combinations right we have a e b but words like b e a BAE um, that are spelled with the same letters uh, don't count as a different event. So here we're looking at the combination that is five from five items, choose three. We read this five, choose three, and we put it in parentheses. This is called a binomial coefficient, and we'll be talking about this a lot going forward. So five, choose three is 10, but five, permute three is 60. Let's put this to work on our example problem. So if we arrange eight books into five slots on a shelf, how many possible outcomes are possible? Okay. Well, this is a permutation because the order matters and we have eight choices for books we could put in the first slot and seven choices for the second slot and so forth until all five slots are filled. So this multiplying eight times seven times six and so forth is a factorial pattern, right? So here eight factorial just means eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. So the factorial, if you're not used to it, it just multiplies by the next successively smaller integer all the way down until we get to one. So the eight factorial divided by three factorial, well, the three factorial is three times two times one, so those have canceled. Um, 
with the 3 times 2 times 1 and the 8 factorial in the numerator, leaving us with just these choices. But you can see how it makes sense. I have 8 things, and I have 5 places to put them. So I have 8 choices at first, and then 7, and then 6, and 5, and 4 choices. So the total number of choices I have is when I multiply them all together. This basic pattern is uh, permutations, and so we'll use this notation for 8 permute 5. So it's called 8 permute 5. Uh, here's the formula. So n permute k, n items, right, n objects, we're permuting n objects into k slots. So k has to be smaller than or equal to n. And we take the number of objects that we have, that's going to be the factorial in the numerator. And then the number of slots we have. Um, we have to take the total number of objects minus the number of slots to get the factorial in the bottom. This is 8 minus 5 is 3. Um, and so here we have n minus k factorial. For the combinations, how do we choose a five card poker hand at random from a standard deck of 52 playing cards? So we're going to use what's called a binomial coefficient, and this is really interesting. So we read this notation here as 52 choose 5, and it means exactly what those words say. It's how many different ways I can choose 5 cards from 52. How, can I, how many ways can I choose 5 objects from 52 where order doesn't matter? And so notice the formula, um, the 52 goes into the numerator, so it's 52 factorial. And then I need this unordered set of five objects. It corresponds to a five factorial in the denominator. And I also have 52 minus five, which is 47 factorial. And you can see the formula here. If I am choosing from n objects um, and putting them into k slots, then I have n choose k. This is how it's going to be read. and that's going to be n factorial over k factorial, right? So the, the 52 and the 5 both are factorials in the numerator and denominator respectively. And then I have 52 minus 5. That's what the n minus k term is here for. And then Cartesian products, if we roll two dice and we sum up their values, how many possible outcomes are there? And the reason I chose this example is because it is kind of easy to see the kind of Cartesian coordinate system setup here, right? So normally we would think of the horizontal axis as the x-axis and the vertical axis as the y-axis. And we would have some point x comma y. And that's all we mean by the, by the Cartesian product, right? Here I have my first die. It has six outcomes um, and I've put the first die, die one, along the y-axis. That may be a little confusing, and I'm sorry if it is. You can switch the one and the two in your notes if you'd like. Um, and die two down here. But basically, I'm just choosing one possible outcome, one through six, to go in the first slot, and one possible outcome, um, one through six, to go in the second slot. So how many slots are there? How many possible outcomes are there? Well, there's six to go in the first position, six to go in the second position. So there's 36 total outcomes. I just multiply how many outcomes there are in the first part of the product and times however many outcomes there are in the second part of the product. Let's take a look at some simple examples to illustrate. How many distinct arrangements of the letters cat are possible? Well, so here we have three letters and we have three slots. We're going to arrange all three letters. So this is just three factorial. I have three choices to put in the first slot, two to put in the second, one to put in the last, though three times two times one is three factorial, which is six. If we draw three cards at random from a standard deck of playing cards, how many outcomes are there? Well, it's fairly easy to say we have 52 things that we're choosing from and three things to be chosen. So we are going to use this binomial coefficient, 52, choose 3. 
which is equal to 52 factorial divided by 3 factorial and also divided by 49 factorial. It looks like 44 factorial there, 49 factorial. Okay. By the way, 52 choose 3 is equal to 22,100 if you want to evaluate that um, on a calculator. So how many three-digit numbers can be made using base six digits only? And so in base six, we have the zero and we have the one. You know, we have to have the additive and multiplicative identity in, in any base system. And then we have four more digits. So we use two, three, four, and five. So in base six, we're only allowed to use those six digits. And how many three-digit numbers can I make? Well, this is a Cartesian product, right? So I have, I have six outcomes that can go in the first slot. And by the way, there's a slight nuance here because I'm allowing zero to go in the first slot. And we normally wouldn't think of this as a three digit number, but we're considering zero one and zero zero one. We're considering those to be three digit numbers as we do this. And then I have six possible digits that can go in the second slot. And then I have six possible digits that can go in the third slot. So we have six cubed, right? This is a Cartesian product. Um, each of the sets, each of the three sets have six objects in them. So it's six cubed or 216. How many license plates are possible if there are three letters followed by four numbers and any letter or number can repeat? Here we have a Cartesian product, right? So three letters. So we have three slots that are going to be filled by one of the 26 letters in the alphabet, followed by four numbers. And any letter or number can repeat. Okay, so right, we have seven slots. And we're going to put a letter and then a letter and then a letter and then a number and a number and a number and a number. So there are 26 options times 26 options times 26 options times 10 times 10 times 10 and times 10. So the total number um, is going to be 26 cubed times 10 to the fourth. Our next example is for 21 students in math club, how many different ways could the math club select a president, a vice president, and a treasurer if no one can hold two offices? Okay, think about why this is permutations. Order matters, right? If you're elected first, you're president. If you're elected second, you're vice president. So those are two different uh, things. So here it is a permutation, order matters. So we're looking at 21 permute three. Um, and so 21 permute 3 is just 21 times 20 times 19, which is 7,980. Sorry, example 6. So here we have the names of 11 students placed in a hat, and this particular teacher is going to select three names. And each of the students will win the same prize. This means it's a combination. If they won different prizes that the students value differently, um, like a candy bar for first prize and only a peppermint for last prize or something, then, then it would be permutations. But since they're getting the same prize, this is going to be combinations. And if Jesus said of all possible groups, what are we doing? Well, we're doing 11 choose 3. So 11 choose 3 is 11 factorial over 3 factorial times 8 factorial. And there are 165 different groupings, different possible groupings of three students when we're choosing from 11. So how many 10 digit numbers can be formed using the digits 3 and 7 only? Well, this is kind of interesting. So I'm making numbers, but now I'm in base 2 because it doesn't really matter what you call them. You can call them three or seven, or you can call them what we normally call them in base two, which is zero and one. But I just get to use two symbols. 
But basically, I'm making words with a two symbol alphabet, right? Or I'm making numbers in base two. So for each of the 10 digits, I get the choice of two things. So it's just simply two to the 10th. This is a Cartesian product where every single one of the sets has two items. And so I'm taking two times two times two, uh, 10 times. So there are 124 binary numbers with two digits, excuse me, with 10 digits. There's two symbols. I'm, yeah, I, sorry about this solution, but we're making we're making ten digit numbers. So, um, when you read this question, we find out that these home buyers are picking um, four different uh, floor plans, right? Three different heating systems. They get to pick a garage or a carport. Um, wait, they get to pick between a garage. Oh, wait, sorry, that's a choice. And then patio versus screened porch. Okay. Well, this is just a Cartesian product, right? They, the first set, they have four options. And the next set of things, they have three options. So it's going to be four times three times two times two, right? Because here are the floor plans. These are the HVAC systems. Um, garage or carport, they got two options, patio or screened in porch. So there's 48 total options. This is a Cartesian product. In how many different ways can a true false test consisting of eight questions be answered? Well, each time you're picking either true or false, we're once again spelling words using a two letter alphabet, right? We're spelling, uh, there are eight questions. So it's an eight letter word made up of trues and falses, T's and F's. This is like um, binary uh, numbers, right? Base two numbers. Uh, so there are gonna be two to the eight options. This is a Cartesian product, right? Each, each of the sets has two elements. There are eight of them. So I multiply two times two times two eight times. So we have a committee of 17 members and we're going to select a subcommittee and we're asking how many possible subcommittees are, there are. Well, this is 17 choose seven, right? I have 17 objects, I choose seven and it's not saying that we're, they're just going to be on the subcommittee. There's no priority. Like there's a chairperson or a vice chair. There's none of that. There's just seven subcommittee members. So since there's no order, this is combinations. And so we're just going to have 17 choose seven possibilities. Example 11 is how many four digit numbers are there where the digits appear in a strictly increasing sequence? This is one of my favorite problems. And when professors say that you should expect it to be a test question, right? I love this question. So, and it's a little bit counterintuitive, but it's also pretty simple when you see how it's done. Usually with, numbers, we expect order to matter, right? So uh, the reason for that, of course, is that, um, you know, the number 23 is different than the number 32. So the order in which they come out is, is important. But that's a little confusing point. Let's take a look a little deeper. So first of all, here's the key. We're going to do draws without replacement. Normally when we draw numbers, we're allowed to pick any of the 10 digits for any of the slots, right? But here, since all four digits have to be different, I need to start with the 10 digits and pick four of them. So I'm going to have 10 choose four. So there are 210 possible ways to choose four different digits out of the 10 that we have. Okay. So that's how many, that's how many different, uh, um, patterns we have. Then the question is of all the possible permutations of the, of the, um, of the four digit number that we pick, how many of them will appear in strictly increasing order, right? Well, there are four factorial patterns for those four numbers but only one of them is actually going to be strictly increasing, right? If I have the numbers one, two, three, and four, any other order is not going to be strictly increasing. Only one, two, three, four will, is the only pattern that works. So 
it's just one times 210. So we end up with just 210 possibilities. Now, this is permutations, but it's slightly different than what we've looked at before because here they're asking us if we're going to be able to put all of these vowels together. So just want to show you this pattern. This is interesting. The way you solve it is you do all the permutations leaving the vowels together. So you kind of think of this super letter, this V, as having an E, an A, and an I in it, right? And then you're doing a, a permutation with an L, a D, an N, a G, and a V. Once we figure out how many ways we can do that, then we can come back and do all the permutations. Well, this is like the very first problem, the example five that we did, or example one. Um, cat, how many permutations? Well, there are gonna be three factorial or six permutations of the vowels once we figure out how many patterns are possible. So, right, if, I, if I'm counting the three vowels as just the super letter V, right, I have V, that's one, L, D, that's two and three, N and G, th four and five. So I have five things that I'm permuting into five slots, that's five factorial. And then I have the three factorial ways that I can permute all of the vowels once I have I have figured out the basic pattern. I figure out where the vowels are located, then I do three factorial to find all the different orderings. So we have 5,040. Now this is interesting. So Jaina Thomas are among eight people from which a committee of four people is to be selected. And how many different possible committees of four can be selected if this is either Jane or Thomas is to be selected? So, or both, right? So we have a situation where at least Jane has to be on it or at least Thomas has to be on it, but it's okay if they're both on it. Okay, so this is combinations. This is combinations, but this is a little bit complicated if we try to go directly. What you'll find is that if we work with the complement of this set, we're gonna get there in a lot, we're gonna get there a lot faster. Um, so if we let J indicate, indicate the event set where Jane is included and T indicates the event set where Thomas is included, then let's take a look at this. J or T, whether, whether Jane or Thomas is on this committee, right, is J union T, which is, this is the principle of inclusion exclusion, right? The number of outcomes in J plus the number of outcomes in T minus the number of outcomes that they have in common. All right, well, we could do that, but we could just say, hey, what about the complement of this? What about finding the, uh, if, if it doesn't happen? Well, if it doesn't happen, there are six people that aren't Jane or Thomas, right? And if we pick all of the possible committee members from those six, then that's the, uh, the total number, or excuse me, we haven't quite finished there. We have found the cardinality of the set complement, but then we'd have to take eight choose four, which is the total number of committees possible, right? And we could subtract eight choose four, which is the total number in the probability space minus six choose four, which would give us the cardinality of the events, event set that we were asked about. So here we have a keypad, and I don't know if you've seen these, maybe if you've been to a vacation rental where they don't have a key, they just give you a code, right? And this is the idea of this problem. Got this keypad lock with 10 different digits. And while they let's just assume that they can't repeat. Um, so that's the key there is that we have five different digits. And if we have five different digits and we're picking from 10, then it's just 10 permute five. And so you can see that this is just 10 factorial divided by five factorial. So that's our last example. They're just trying to use our basic counting patterns um, to, to figure these things out. 
And let's talk about partitions. This is going to be really important in a couple of sections. And, and so what happens is if I have a set partition, uh, there are various subsets. I can do my counting inside the subsets and just multiply when I get done counting up the um, event, the outcomes um, that are in each subset. So let's look at this. There are five women and six men in a group. And from this group, we're going to choose a committee of four people. How many different ways can a committee be formed that contain three women and one man? Okay, so here's the cool thing, right? I already have a partition. I have the subset of women and the subset of men. So I can just choose however many women I need from these five, right? And that's three. So I can use a five, choose three. And then I can use a six, choose one. I can just do the count up the um, outcomes I need in the first subset, count up the, the outcomes I need from the second subset, and then to figure out how many total possibilities there are, I can multiply those together. So if you let W3 be the event set where three women are selected, then we have, just like we said, five choose three times six choose one, which is 525 possible committees of this configuration. So um, we haven't, there will, partitions will make our life a lot easier and we'll see a lot more of examples where we'll use these when it comes back to probability. So this concludes the second portion of the probability part of our course. Be sure to read the course notes for section two and complete your completion quiz. Good luck.